with you once again here to discuss the South Carolina primary and the interesting week that was in that little political race. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize just off the, the top here. Uh, I'm feeling just a hair under the weather this week, so you may not get the usual P and V out of me that you're used to. But uh, what happened last week in South Carolina and over the weekend especially was extremely significant. I definitely wanted to comment on it and, and just kind of show you how we got to where we are and what it means for the future with this. Uh, first of all, if you remember my uh, last full presentation, uh, number 45 in the America's Evil Genius series, I made the point that the Republican Party at South Carolina needed, or a conservative movement, I should say, in South Carolina, needed to coalesce around one candidate and kind of tie our wagon to that one candidate and fight Mitt Romney and Ron Paul going forward through the rest of the, of the campaign process. And I had made the statement that I thought that person should be Rick Santorum. Well, when I look at the results of South Carolina last Saturday, uh, I'm largely pleased with how it came out because it's clear that the conservative movement and the conservative voters have finally coalesced around one candidate pretty clearly. Granted, it's not Rick Santorum, who, is, who I would have preferred, but it is Newt Gingrich, and as I mentioned in a special comment that I released last week when Rick Perry got out of the race, I'm willing to accept Newt Gingrich at this point. He's not perfect, there's significant issues I have with him, but I do believe that he will be influenced by the conservative part of the Republican Party, and that we can have some influence on him, and that he will effectively do our bidding for us. And as, as you recall, I said last week that Republicans, including conservatives, are not looking for a leader to emerge from the Republican presidential primary race. We're not looking for a leader in the sense of someone we will follow. We're looking for a spokesperson. We're looking for someone who can take the ideas that we have and the values that we have up to Washington, express them, and implement them. Newt Gingrich does fit the bill on that, and he's looking more and more like that every day. So I'm fine with getting, uh, getting behind him, and I'm glad, more than anything else, that the conservatives really have coalesced around one guy. Newt Gingrich winning the primary of 40%. Mitt Romney, who was you know, ahead in the polls coming into last week, and who everybody thought once he wrapped this thing up in South Carolina, oh, it's done. He lost by double digits. He finished second with 27. And uh, Rick Santorum is still in the race. He got about 17. And like I say, I like him, but uh, I, I think he's far enough behind now that it's pretty well over for him. So I think all of us on the conservative side should coalesce around Newt Gingrich. But the interesting thing to me is to see how and why the Newt Gingrich phenomena, if you will, has emerged. Why is he getting such, uh, such a, a positive uptick at this given time? And, and, and you know, the media is kind of questioning it, and, and people say, oh, there's no way Newt Gingrich can win. And is this the best you can do? People kind of making fun of it a little bit. But I think the emergence of Newt Gingrich is easily explainable. A lot of people are explaining it away as, oh, in South Carolina, there are a bunch of racists down there, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Absolutely not. It's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot deeper than that. And it goes back and tells a story that's been the case throughout the entire GOP presidential uh, nominating process. I'll tell you what's working for Newt Gingrich now as much as it ever has. Think back over the last six, seven, eight months and think of all the different front runners that we've had in this thing. All the different people that the conservatives were kind of flirting with and maybe we'd get behind them. And, and we've always been against Romney from day one. You know that. That hasn't changed. But you look back at a Donald Trump. You look back at a Herman Cain, and now you look at a Newt Gingrich. And you look even further back to 2008, to Sarah Palin, and, and how we had such a positive reaction to her in, in the 2008 presidential election. What is the one common thread among all of those people? Sarah Palin, Donald Trump, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich. What's the one single thread? Well, it's not really a policy-related thread, because all four of them have somewhat different ideas at times on various topics. So it's, it's not a carbon copy of conservatism that all four of them espouse. But the one thing all of them have in common is a willingness and really even a, a relishment, if you want to say it, a willingness and a relishment to take the fight to the enemy. People who are not afraid to go out on a limb and speak their mind and to hell with what the media says about it, to hell with what the politically correct conventional wisdom says about it, they know what they believe is right and wrong, and they're going to say it come hell or high water. And that has a lot of appeal to conservatives in this particular election cycle. You know, a lot of us are, are sick and tired 
throughout all of our lives of seeing the Republican Party put up these milquetoast candidates that would, yeah, they try to fight on the issues for you, but, but they wouldn't want to offend anybody, and they wouldn't want to run off moderates, and they wouldn't want to, want to run off independents, and they wouldn't want to run off minorities. So what they would do is they would sugarcoat their message so much that nothing of substance really ever came out of it. And, and people like Palin way in the past, and Donald Trump for the brief time he was in, and Herman Cain for his extended rise, and Newt Gingrich now, they're willing to do that. They're willing to kill the sacred cows, if you will, to put the right message, the sensible message out there. Now, one of the uh, controversies, if you want to call it that, that surrounded Newt Gingrich this week, but really one, one of the things that really helped him win, in my estimation, was the confrontation with Juan Williams at the Fox debate. And you have undoubtedly seen this exchange several times. I'm not going to play the whole thing for you. Uh, and you undoubtedly have heard people say, oh, well, that's coded racism. Those are code words. Those are dog whistles. And the South Carolina is just like the South Carolina 50 years ago because they responded to it. And people are really trying to downplay the message that Newt Gingrich sent, or shall I say falsify the message that Newt Gingrich sent, misinterpret the message that Newt Gingrich sent when he shouted down one Williams in this debate. But let's take a look at this. I, as I said, I'm not going to show you the whole exchange. But what I want to show you, courtesy of Fox News, is the actual questions that Juan Williams asked that started this whole kerfuffle. I'm not going to give you Newt Gingrich's responses. You've probably heard them ad infinitum right now. But what I want you to pay particular attention to is the phrasing that Juan Williams uses and the connection that Juan Williams tries to make. Roll it. Speaker Gingrich, you recently said black Americans should demand jobs not food stamps. You also said poor kids lack a strong work ethic and propose having them work as janitors in their schools. Can't you see that this is viewed at a minimum as insulting to all Americans, but particularly to black Americans? The suggestion that you made was about a lack of work ethic. And I gotta tell you, my email account, my Twitter account has been inundated with people of all races who are asking if your comments are not intended to belittle the poor and racial minorities. You saw some of this reaction during your visit to a black church in South Carolina. So Juan Williams, in both of those questions, tried to make the connection between poverty and race. And this is nothing new from the left. You've seen them do this for decades. Almost any time a Democrat or a leftist speaks of issues of poverty or issues of economics, they almost always tie that to issues of race. They almost always try to make it appear as though extended poverty is an extension of racism. That if you criticize those who are poor, well, you're being racially insensitive. If you try to, if you try to uh, use a conservative mindset in solving those issues, you're being racist because the poverty only exists because of the racism. That's the story that the left would try to tell you. And there's becoming more and more of a pushback from the conservatives on that. You certainly saw it with Newt Gingrich. First of all, it's a completely ridiculous idea that only minorities are affected by poverty. That's absolute hogwash. And that if we try to do things that will help the poverty issues in America that somehow we're going to insult minorities. It's more of a concern whether or not we insult minorities instead of whether or not we actually do things that will help the poor in the long run. You see how twisted that is? It's nuts! And it's not even true! I mean, we talked on this show several months back about why blacks should leave the Democratic Party. And we gave you a lot of statistics at that time from people like Dr. Thomas Sowell who have done a just a mountainous amount of work in this field. And we proved unequivocally that long-term poverty, whether we're talking about it in the African American community or anywhere else, is not an extension of racism. We gave you some stats. I'm going to repeat them here. Let's go back to the era of Jim Crow. Let's go back to the era prior to the Civil Rights Act. Let's go back to the era prior to the Great Society, when African Americans faced much larger challenges than they do today in terms of discrimination and racism and the like. And no one's going to say that that was a positive time at all. We're not going to say that one bit. However, in the midst of all that negativity that the African American community were dealing with, there's some interesting statistics. In 1940, poverty among black families was 87%. 1970, 
By 1960, again, that 20-year period that was right in the middle of all the Jim Crow and the discrimination and everything else, in that 20-year period, poverty among black families dropped from 87% to 47%. Incomes of blacks relative to whites doubled between 1936 and 1959. Again, right in the middle of that horrible era of Jim Crow. And no one's saying that that the, the Jim Crow and all that, the segregation was positive. Nobody's saying that. But it's interesting to see that in an era of such racism, blacks were making such tremendous strides. In 1940, 86% 80, of black children were born inside of marriage. The illegitimacy rate was only 15%. By 2006, well after the era of Jim Crow, well after the era of segregation, well after the era of rampant racism, well after the era of the Great Society and the social programs and, and throwing money hand over fist at strengthening the black community, in 2006, only 31% of black children were born inside of marriage. And the illegitimacy rate was greater than 70%. Again, all of those statistics coming from Dr. Thomas Sowell, we've mentioned them on this program before, but I think it illustrates an ex extremely important point that for those who would try to tie long-term poverty to racism, or for those who would try to tie the experience of the current members of the African-American community to some long-standing institutional racism or discrimination or the like, the numbers will show you that in an era of far more discrimination, of far fewer opportunities, of far more in the ways of segregation and more overt types of racism in society, in that era, blacks were making more strides. Blacks were effectively doing better, or at least on their way to doing better during those times, as opposed to the period of time that the liberals took over, got a significant amount of influence in the black community, sold them on the government being their answer to everything, and it's gone downhill from there. That's something the left doesn't want to talk about very often. And indeed, I grew up in southern Missouri and I could take you I could take you to any number of places where you will see just as much reliance on food stamps, just as much reliance on welfare, just as much illegitimacy, just as much in terms of women having children outside of marriage and producing kids to get welfare checks, just as much drug usage. I could show you all of that in rural parts of this state just as much proportionally to what you would see in the inner city and not a black face among them. And the reason that would be important for you to see is because it would finally open your eyes to the fact that the character issues and bad decision making that form long term poverty are not specific to one particular race or minority. It goes all around. And let me be very blunt. This is exactly what Newt Gingrich was saying in his responses to Juan Williams. Let me be very clear that white welfare queen, meth addict in a rural town who's living off of welfare, that person is just as deplorable as the black welfare queen addicted to crack living in an inner city. It's the same thing. The skin color doesn't matter. Both are deplorable. Neither should be pandered to. That's what Newt Gingrich was saying, and more importantly, that's what all of us in the conservative movement have been saying for years, and it's refreshing to finally see some people within the Republican Party who are taking that mantle and who are unafraid to express those points. You see, what we like about Newt Gingrich, and indeed part of what we liked of Herman Cain, part of what we liked of Donald Trump for the brief period of time he was involved in this, although Trump never, never got into talking about real substantive issues, he was mainly China and birth certificates, that's all he ever talked about, but he was at least up front and he was at least unafraid to confront the media, to confront the left, con to confront Obama, to even confront the Republican Party. That's what we want. We see how Newt Gingrich interacts with these debate moderators and basically wins the arguments with all of them. And some people say it's classless and it's, you know, he, he's condescending and everything else. That might be true to a point. But what you have to understand is that when these moderators are taking these positions against the Republicans, and Newt being one of the few that will confront them on it. What they're basically doing 
is using the same talking points and using the same arguments that Barack Obama will be using in the general election. They may not be doing it as well as Obama will do it. Obama's probably a little bit more practiced at it. He's probably a little better at it than someone like a Juan Williams or a Brian Williams over on NBC or a John King over on CNN. But the reason it's important that Newt Gingrich or somebody shout these people down is because they are basically making the same points that Barack Obama will make in the general election. So when Newt Gingrich shouts them down and wins those arguments with them, it shows that he can do the same to Barack Obama. And make no mistake, to us who are conservatives, to we who are conservatives, this election is not simply about winning the White House. Of course that's important. But this election is about riding the ship of America. This election is not only about beating them at the ballot box. This election is about completely minimizing and completely marginalizing the way of thinking that a Barack Obama and the typical American leftist has. It's been proven for the last hundred years that their way of doing things has not worked. And the Republican Party that has come before this generation has either been ill-equipped or unwilling to fight them tooth and nail on it. This generation is. You know, I think back to uh, one of my favorite hockey announcers, a guy named Jack Edwards. He's the announcer for the Boston Bruins. And you guys have seen me wear Boston Bruins jerseys out here before. Uh, you know I like that team. Jack Edwards is a great announcer, but everybody outside of Boston hates him. <laughs> because he will be very upfront, and he is a homer. And I remember something he said after a Boston-Montreal game one time where the Bruins had won in dominating fashion. Jack Edwards said, Tonight they have beaten them, and they have beaten them up. Indicating that it wasn't just a win on a scoreboard, it was a win in all facets of the game. They beat him in goals, they beat him in hits, they won the fights, they beat them down. To the point that the next morning when the other team would wake up, and they would get out of bed and they would be in pain, they would know it was because they were the lesser team. That's what conservatives want out of this election. We don't just want to beat Obama, we want to beat him up. We don't just want to beat those who agree with Obama and who stand for what he stands for, we want to beat him up. We want to completely eviscerate him in these debates. We want to show the American people for once and for all how absolutely wrong, ridiculous, asinine, and dangerous everything that Barack Obama and the American left stand for is. And I'm sorry, but Mitt Romney can't do it. I think Newt Gingrich can. Newt Gingrich will show them for the fools that they are, and hopefully that will be the first step in marginalizing them for the rest of American history. This is not about cooperation. You can't cooperate with them. Because their ideas are too far gone. You must ideologically eliminate them. They can no longer have a place at the table in American politics. And that's what this uprising has been about from day one. Whether we're talking about the Tea Party or the grassroots or the sudden emergence of a Newt Gingrich. While people talk about the flavor of the month and the different people that have come along. There's some amazing consistencies in all of it that people are overlooking. The fact that conservatives are finally ready to take the bull by the horns and make the arguments against the Democrats themselves. Because God knows we've had a party who has been unwilling to take the fight to them for too long. And we're at the point of saying, all right, if you guys won't nominate someone who will fight Barack Obama, we will. And if we have to fight you in order to do it, we will. It's a new day for the Republican Party. It's a new day for America, and I believe it's going to be a glorious day. I'm behind Newt Gingrich now, and I can't wait for the next few months. I can't wait to take over this party and set it on the right course. And I can't wait not only to beat Barack Obama, but to beat him up. In an electoral sense, of course. But to beat him up in those debates. To show America how ridiculous he's been. That's it for this week. Big week coming up now. Florida 
is on the horizon. We've got debates this week. We've got a State of the Union address slash campaign speech coming up on Tuesday night. And you, you watch some. I almost bet you that Barack Obama is going to make at least a couple of comments towards this wing of the Republican Party who's backing Newt Gingrich and who is cheering when he, when he goes after these political commentators and who, is, who, who have been so vociferous at these debates. And he's going to go after us because he knows that we're not just booing those moderators, we're booing him. This is going to be a real interesting week, folks. And we'll go over all of it next week here on America's Evil Genius. In the meantime, stay safe. God bless America. We'll see you next week.